So for the rest of today, I want to talk about generic programming. So let's suppose that I wrote a brilliant, fantastic, amazing, stupendously awesome sorting algorithm. We haven't talked about sorting algorithms. We'll talk about them later on. But let's suppose that I came up with this just fantastic sorting algorithm. So here is my super sort class. And somewhere in my class, I have a method, let's say, um, that takes an integer of arrays, does a sort on them. And this is such an amazing sort. Nobody's ever come up with anything this brilliant before. Okay, And I sort this array. I'm not going to tell you how I sort this array. I'm going to leave that as a surprise for you. So here we do a sort, and then we return our array. OK, there's our class. This is such a cool sorting method that I've got it for integers, and now I want to use it for strings. So how can I use this sorting method for strings? I can use generic programming. That's why, what we're going to talk about. But without generic programming, what would I have to do? I'd have to make it a string, right? So instead of saying int here, I'd have to say string. That's cool. Now I've got a string method. Then if I want to come up with a method that can sort a person object that we were talking about the other day, I'd have to go through all of my code, and every time I find string, I'd have to replace it with person. This is not really a good way to write code. right? You don't want to keep changing code. You want to write one piece of code, one efficiently debugged sorting algorithm that's amazing that can sort anything. And so the goal of generic programming is to be able to sort anything. Okay, That's our goal. So when we talked about objects the other day, we talked about a person object, and we had students, and we had undergraduate. We also had faculty. Okay. And the other thing that I mentioned is that Every object is an object. Okay. So above our person, there's an object class. Every object is an object. So person is an object, student is an object, undergraduate is an object, faculty is an object. So if I wanted to make a data structure, let's say I wanted to make an array, that could hold person, student, undergraduate, or faculty, what kind of array could I make? An object array, right? So I could, um, for example, define an object array. Here's an object array definition that holds 10 elements. Now, if I wanted to add Let's say I want to add students to my object array. I can create a student. Here, I'm creating a student. This is the point where the JVM figures out how much memory a student needs to be allocated to it, allocates that memory on the heap, and initiates any variables that we need initiated. I can convert my student to an object, I can cast my student to an object, and I can add that to the beginning of the array. OK, cool. So now I've got an array of student objects. 
I'm going to take a little aside here and remind you about some of the inheritance that we talked about the other day. So we talked about um, methods that each of these could have. So a student, for example, might have a red ID method and a year method. And an undergraduate might have a year method. And if we define an undergraduate variable that's a member of the undergraduate class, its year method overrides the student's year method, yeah? Similarly, our person object might have a name, and our undergraduate object would override its name. Or, if undergraduate does not include a name method, it would just use the person's name method. There's a couple of important methods that are defined in the object class. The first one is equals. Okay. And so if we want to ask whether two things are equal to each other, we can use the equals method. But objects don't know anything about undergraduates or students or persons or faculty. Objects know about objects. So if we call the object equals method, the only thing it knows about is objects. So the way that Java tells whether two objects are the same is whether the place that they're pointing to on the heap is the same place. So our equals method, method here compares the memory location of the two objects and says, are they equal or not? If we're comparing undergraduates, that's probably not what we want to do, right? If we're comparing undergraduates, we probably want to say, do they have the same first name and last name, or the same red ID, or the same email address, or the same home address? We don't want to compare them by memory location. And so if we define an undergraduate class, we need to override the equals method so that we know whether two undergraduates are equal to each other. The second method the object defines is toString. If we print out an object, if we use something like system out println our student, Java calls the s.toString method to print out that student. Again, objects only know about objects. They don't know anything about undergraduates or students or people or cars or monkeys or what other types of data we have. So the only thing objects know to print out when you call the toString method is the memory location of the object. So this prints the memory location of the object, probably not what we want to see. So we have to override in our classes the toString method. The third method that we need to override is called hash code. And you guys are going to see a lot about hash code in about a month. And so I'm not going to talk about what hash code does right now. It's just important to remember there are several methods that we need to override when we define classes in Java. So we have a generic object that we've defined. We, we create an array of objects. We create a student object. We cast the student object to be an object. And we can store that in our array. All right, so we've got okay. an array. We can put stuff in it. So if I take this and I've got students in my array, what happens if I now do this? So I've started with an array. I've added a student object to my array. 
Then I created a monkey object and added that to my array. And then I created a string object and, and added that to my array. Is that OK? Will that compile? It will. It will. These are monkeys are objects. Strings are objects. Students are objects. So I've got an array of objects. Everything is cast to an object. And now I've got an array that's got monkeys, strings, and students in it. So it'll compile fine, but it's not a very psychologically pleasing piece of code because we've mixed up a whole bunch of different things. And so the solution to this is what is called parameterized types. And as we'll see, parameterized types allow us to define what we're going to put in a particular kind of container. <laughs>